Emmanuel, and welcome to church this morning. I'm so glad to see there are so many of you logged in this morning. If there's anyone from outside of the Emmanuel or Waterloo Wayside communities, I would love to extend a very special welcome. We are so glad that you are here. As many of you know, um, once a year, our MS, our Mission and Service Committee, um, is responsible for and loves to facilitate a worship service. And so that Sunday is today. And in keeping with our broader theme for 2020 of um, delving deeper into spiritual ecology, uh, today's service will be. Uh, 
centered around that theme. And so I'm excited to let you know that uh, several of our mission and service committee members will be participating in the service today. And I'm also really excited to tell you that we have our guest speaker today, Isaiah Ritzman. He comes to us from the Working Center and I will say a little bit more about Isaiah when we uh, when we get to that portion of the service. But for now, I would just like to extend a very special welcome to Isaiah. We're so glad that you're here to, um, to spend some time uh, in worship with us today. So with that, friends, uh, let us begin in the usual way by acknowledging the territory upon which we are gathered and opening in prayer. And for anyone who might be joining us outside of the uh, Haldeman Tract, I would invite you then to reflect on the land you do find yourself on and the first peoples that inhabit that land. So for us, we acknowledge the traditional territory upon which we gather. In 1784, the Haldeman Treaty granted a tract of land to the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Iroquois peoples as compensation for their alliance with British forces during the American Revolution. This tract of land includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River, which is known as the Haldeman Tract. The original peoples of this land include the Attawandaran, also known as the Neutral Peoples, and the Anishinaabe. Today, less than 5% of this territory remains Six Nations land. The original peoples have sought to walk gently on this land and we endeavor to follow their example. We seek a new relationship with First Nations peoples through truth and reconciliation. And we actively seek right relations based in honor and in deep respect. And friends, a quote from biblical scholar N.T. Wright. All the beauty of the world, the beauty that calls our admiration, our gratitude, our worship at the earthly level is meant as a set of hints, conspiratorial whispers of clues and suggestions, flickers of light all nudging us into believing that behind the beautiful world is not random chance, but the loving God. Let us pray. God, our creator, as we reflect on the mystery of our fragile planet, we celebrate the wonders of Earth as our home. Help us to discern how we have polluted our planet and to empathize with the groaning of creation beneath us. Teach us to sense your presence pulsing through the earth as a living green and blue sanctuary. Teach us to love earth as our home in the name of Christ, the word of God, who is a creative pulse, a creative impulse in all creation. Amen. Friends, at this time, I would invite Mary Sulis to read for us our minute for mission. Over to you, Mary. Good morning. Today's uh, minute for mission is titled Access to Clean Water. Water is sacred, a gift of the creator and a source of light. Clean water is a cornerstone of public health and a fundamental human right. In 2015, United Nations member states established 17 goals essential to sustainable development. The sixth goal is the availability of clean water for all. Access to safe drinking water is one of today's most pressing environmental issues. Large numbers of people have no access to water and lack adequate sanitation to keep water sources clean. According to UN statistics, millions of people die every year from diseases associated with inadequate water supply, sanitation, and hygiene. 
more than 2 billion people are currently living with the risk of reduced access to fresh water resources. By 2050, at least one in four people is likely to be affected by a chronic shortage of fresh water. The United Church of Canada, as a member of the World Council of Churches, joined with other churches in the Ecumenical Water Network, or EWN, a mission and service partner. The EWN brings churches together in faith-based advocacy for the preservation, responsible management, and the equitable distribution of water for all. On the ground, mission and service partners like People's Action Forum in Zambia and the Moravian Church in Nicaragua played roles in establishing community access to water, from digging boreholes to, to providing training on pump maintenance and the protection of water supply. Your gifts to the Mission and Service Fund help bring the provision of clean water to all people closer to reality. And as I was reading that um, Minute for Mission, I realized that it really has an international focus. And so it prompted me to do a bit of research about access to clean water in Canada. The following is information that I picked up from the Council of Canadians work website and from Honoreen Scott, the Healing Programs Coordinator in the Ind Indigenous Ministry Circle of the United Church of Canada. For many, safe and readily accessible water is not viewed as a luxury. Unless you live in an Indigenous community, then it is a luxury. Despite the lack of safe water, many Indigenous people choose to stay in their communities to maintain their family connections, community, culture, and language. No one should have to sacrifice this just to have access to clean drinking water that is ready available to almost all non-Indigenous communities. Across Canada at any given time over 100 Indigenous communities are under boil water advisories. For example, Grassy Narrows is a First Nation community in northwestern Ontario whose waterways were poisoned by lumber mill pollution from the early 1960s to 1970s. The consequences have left residents with mercury poisoning and their local economy is in ruin. Some of the advisories date as far back as 1995, that's 25 years ago, for those of us who don't realize how long ago that was. For the Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, I that is one of the ones that goes back to that date. Ironically, Shoal Lake uh, First Nations is on what the Shoal Lake on which they are located provides all the drinking water for the city of Winnipeg, but they don't have clean drinking water. Some advisories are so old that you could have a 16 year old girl growing up in Northern Ontario who has never been able to drink or bathe in the water that they have access to. In 2010, the United Nations declared that water and sanitation are human rights, acknowledging they are essential to the realization of all other rights. The lack of clean, safe drinking water in Canada's First Nations is one of the greatest violations of the UN recognized human rights to water and sanitation. 73% of First Nations water systems are at high or medium risk for contamination. The United Church of Canada I couldn't find anything, any specific things that the United Church of Canada is doing related to water, but through their uh, social action, justice and reconciliation initiatives, uh, they are providing support to our First Nations peoples. So that's it. Thank you very much for sharing that information and that, that um, uh, very, very important work that the United Church of Canada is doing. And um, so, friends, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, a peace the world cannot give. May the peace of Christ be with you. Know that we are holding each other close in this time of being apart. Amen. So at this time, I'd like to invite the kids, uh, if we have any kids out there watching, to open your cameras 
And for everyone else, uh, if you put your setting on um, view active cameras, then you'll be able to see the kids as they come on in. Hi, there we go. We've got some kids today. There's, I see uh, Delaney and oh, here comes Erica. Hello, Erica. There's Roman. Do you want to give a wave, Roman and Delaney? Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. So I wanted to have a little chat with you this morning and we're going to watch a bit of a video, but um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the topic that we're talking about today. So, oh, there's Bridget. Hi, Bridget. Do you want to wave? Hi. Today we are talking about spiritual ecology. Now, that is a big fancy term, but basically all it really means is how are we connected to each other and to the earth? So spiritual ecology is all about thinking about how our bodies are sustained by the earth and how we are connected with each other. And you'll remember last week, we talked about the vines and the branches, and we talked about how Jesus told us that we are connected, like vines and branches are connected. And we talked about our little friends, right? Ivy and Polka and Purple and Coffee, and how they are now all living in a community in which they are all connected. And if you think about what's happening in the world right now and how we're all staying home as an act of love for one another, but what's happening in the world right now just really goes to show us how something that happens in one part of the world can affect something on the other side of the world. That's where we are. And so today is really all about how we are connected. Now, you know how Jesus always is telling us to love and take care of our neighbor, right? Remember that? Nod. Yeah, Jesus loves us to take care of our neighbor. But what we've also discovered, kids, is that the earth is also our neighbor. And so if the earth is our neighbor, then we must look for ways to love and care for the earth as well. So those are the things that we're talking about today. Who here has seen the movie about the Lorax, called The Lorax? It's a, I think it's Dr. Seuss, right? And, and it's a really great movie. It's one of my favorites. And so I encourage you all to go, and if you're looking for something to do, you can watch the movie The Lorax, because it's all about how to um, treat the Earth as our neighbor. And so let's watch a little video uh, where everybody is singing a wonderful song about letting things grow because the earth is always just trying to grow new and wonderful things to make our bodies healthy. So let's let things grow and let's watch a little video now about that. And so thank you for coming and joining me and for a little bit of time today and uh, I hope that um, you all take some time to hug a tree or say hello to a plant and think about how the earth is growing things so that we can be healthy people. Now, let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for the ways that you teach us how to love each other. And we thank you for the ways that you have taught us that the earth is also our neighbor and we must care for the earth because what we do to the earth we are actually doing to ourselves 
thank you for being with us today and uh, we know that you are with us every day and we thank you to God our creator for always keeping us connected to one another. Amen. We'll see you again at the end of the service. Okay, kids? Bye for now. Okay, at this time, I would invite Carolyn Sullivan, who is going to read for us our scripture readings today. So over to you, Carolyn. Thank you, Jen. Today's scripture readings are a synopsis of the verses that are listed in the order of service. From the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, 1 to 25. The birth of earth. God creates the physical universe. The central character in the Genesis 1 story is earth. Earth waits beneath the waters below and at God's summons, emerges from the waters like a child at birth. And then at God's command, brings forth all the fauna and flora on our planet. From the Psalms, Psalm 33, one to nine. The word of the Lord in creation. The Psalmist summons us all, earth and her inhabitants, to praise God with song and musical instruments because of what God's word has done. The word is the means by which God created the skies, earth, and all the seas. From the epistles, Romans 1, 18 to 23, creation proclaims God's presence. St. Paul declares that people have no real excuse for thinking God is not real or really present. Take a look at creation. It reveals God's eternal power and divine nature. From the Gospels, from John chapter 1, 1 to 14. The Word becomes part of earth. The Word that is before all things and is God is the source of all creation, and that word becomes flesh and blood, the very stuff of creation. The word of life becomes part of the living planet called Earth. And now I would like to invite Linda Oliver to share a poem with us. Good morning, thanks Carolyn. I'm going to read you a letter from the coronavirus. The earth whispered, but you did not hear. The earth spoke, but you did not listen. The earth screamed, but you turned her off. And so I was born. I was not born to punish you. I was born to awaken you. The earth cried out for help, massive flooding, but you didn't listen. Burning fires, but you didn't listen. Strong hurricanes, but you didn't listen. Terrifying tornadoes, but you didn't listen. You still don't listen to the earth when ocean animals are dying due to pollutants in the waters, glaciers, glaciers melting at an alarming rate, severe drought. You didn't listen to how much negativity the earth is receiving, nonstop wars, nonstop greed. You just kept going on with your life, no matter how much hate there, there was no matter how many killings daily. It was more important to get that latest iPhone than worry about what the earth was trying to tell you. But now I am here and I've made the world stop in its tracks. I've made you finally listen. I've made you take refuge. I've made you stop thinking about materialistic things. Now you are like the earth. You're only, world about you, only worried about your survival. How does that feel? I give you fever as the fires burn on earth. I give you respiratory issues as pollution fills the earth's air. I give you weakness as the earth weakens every day. I took away your comforts, your outings, the things you would use to forget about the planet and its pain. And I made the world stop. And now? China has better air quality, 
Skies are clear blue because factories are not spewing pollution upon the Earth's air. The water in Venice is clean because the gondola boats that pollute the water are not being used. You are having to take time to reflect on what is important in your life. Again, I am not here to punish you. I'm here to awaken you. When all this is over and I am gone, please remember these moments. Listen to the earth. Listen to your soul. Stop polluting the earth. Stop fighting amongst each other. Stop caring about materialistic things and start loving your neighbor. Start caring about the earth and all its creatures. Start believing in a creator because next time I may come back even stronger. Sign coronavirus. Thank you so much for sharing those powerful, powerful words. And now I am excited to um, invite uh, Isaiah Ritzman to share his um, presentation and his message with us that another future is possible. Isaiah is uh, an educator and uh, public speaker with the uh, Working Center. Um, Isaiah also has been facilitating a uh, coping with climate uh, support group in the community, which I've attended a couple of times and I've always found to be incredibly meaningful. So I am very pleased to invite Isaiah to be with us today and share his wisdom with us. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Isaiah. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and hello, everyone. Everyone, I'm happy to be with you here this morning, if uh, um, over the internet and in spirit rather than in person and in flesh. Um, and I'm also uh, very grateful today to share with you some of my thoughts on hope in a time of ecological crisis. Just waiting for my presentation to appear for you. There we go. This has been a theme in my life for a really long time. Um, I've experienced both uh, deep hopelessness as well as deep hope uh, when it comes to climate change and other environmental realities. And today, both as a person and as a person of faith, I wanna reflect on how do we relate to hope uh, during this time. But first of all, I wanna make a, a couple of distinctions. First of all, I'm not talking about hope versus despair. This is often how uh, we talk about the issue. If you go to uh, a climate change discussion or perhaps a documentary, usually the issue is framed as, do we have hope or is it all hopeless? But for me in my experience and reflecting what I've seen in other people, I've realized it's not about hope versus despair. It's actually about false hope versus false despair. And what I mean by that is that often I see uh, hope, and, and this is both from my own personal experience as well as from observations outside, I see people hope when they really shouldn't hope, um, whether they put their hope in one particular solution to a problem. Or on the other hand, sometimes I see people, uh, including myself, fall into despair when despair isn't warranted. And I think the reason for this is our, our minds are limited. Um, there's more in reality than we know, and often we confuse what we know for the whole of reality. And so we say, oh, because of this thing, there must be hope, or because of this thing, there must be despair. And throughout this talk this morning, I'm gonna reflect on some experiences in my own life where I've broken through uh, both false hope and despair, and how, how both of those things have, have affected me. So the question this morning is not, is there hope? Now, I should say the question, is there hope, is still an important question, um, both in society and at, at large, but as well as for us as, as people of faith. Uh, but for me, the question is not only, is there hope? The question is, how can I avoid false hope and false despair. 
Now, when I talk about false hope and false despair, I'm, I'm talking specifically uh, within environmental context. As we look to our future and we look to our planet and we see what's going on, uh, both hope and despair can be very powerful emotions. But when I talk about false hope and false despair, I'm sure many of you have seen both in your own life, in your families, in your workplaces, and in your communities, um, often hope that is not hope and despair that is not grounded um, are, are realities that we live in. Both false hope and false despair, they're both pervasive. They're everywhere. I could probably think about even in the last month or the last year, things I hoped for and things I did not hope for in kind of small or big ways, um, how pervasive both of those were. And both are dangerous. Maybe in small amounts, they can be a bit innocent. But when we're talking about transitioning to a sustainable society, when we're seeking right relationships with the earth, where we can treat the earth like a neighbor or a brother, both false hope and false despair can be dangerous. And I'll, I'll get into why in a moment. And finally, both are within our power. Now, I'm not saying that hope and despair are simply mind tricks that we have to convince ourselves to be hopeful or, or convince ourselves not to be despairing, and it's all kind of in our heads. Clearly, there's, there's a world out there, and our, our feelings or our emotions of hope and despair do respond to that world. But I'm going to reflect a little bit this morning about uh, personal practices, things we can do um, to check false hope and false despair, to make sure we don't fall into either extreme. So what I really want to talk about, talking about another future is possible, is to talk about the hope that can exist beyond false hope and false despair. Hope for a future, hope for a sustainable society, hope for right relationship with the earth that is not based on either false hope or false despair. The first reason why this is important is because hope is an agent within history. The, uh, the picture below here is uh, Franklin Roosevelt, um, who was elected president of the United States during the Great Depression. Um, and in his inaugural address, he had the famous line, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And what he meant by that in the midst of the Great Depression is that people's fears about how bad the economy was getting was actually making the economy worse. Out of fear, people would, let's say, uh, stop spending money or pull out their investments from the bank or things like that. And it was acting out of that fear that then became a self-perpetuating prophecy. And what I want to suggest to you is just as the only thing we have to fear is fear itself to a certain extent, the thing we can hope for is hope. Now, I want to uh, play a little, uh, exp have a little experiment or imagination right now. I want to ask you to imagine what does false hope and false despair do? What happens? when individual people or groups of people either live in false hope or false despair. What I want to suggest to you this morning is that these feelings exhibit themselves in individual and institutional behavior. People and their communities act out of false hope and false despair. And when they act out of false hope and false despair, the world changes. What happens when people act out of uh, false despair, for example? When people believe that the situation is hopeless, they don't act to change it. When people believe nothing can change, nothing will change. And on the other hand, what happens when people act out of false hope? When people act out of false hope, um, they often invest their time, their resources, their energy 
and things that go nowhere or things that are not the best things to invest their time or their resources in. They put all their eggs in the wrong bas basket, so to speak. So when I, the first aspect of hope that I want to talk about this morning is understanding that these feelings of hope that we have, whether they're, they're the right hope or, or false hope or false despair, they, they change our world because they impel us to act. And out of those actions, we change the world around us. So it is imperative, important, that we try to resist false hope and false despair. I talk about this this morning partially because I've seen in, in my studies of, of history and, and in my observations of my own life, how dangerous both false hope and false despair can be. I'll get into some examples later, but think about your own life. Think about the people around you. What has happened when you've been hopeless when you don't need to be hopeless? And on the other hand, what has happened when you have hoped in something that you should not have hoped in? I can tell you from my own life that neither are the best thing. And as I look at history, I see the dangers of hopelessness where you should actually be hopeful. As well, I see the dangers when people put all their, again, hope eggs in the wrong hope basket, when they expect this one political leader, for example, to be the savior and things like that. So hope is an agent in history, but at the same time, we can be agents of hope. And what I mean by this is two things. First, I think to some extent, hope and despair are within our own power. Now, I'll talk from personal experience here. There have been times where I've been either too hopeful or too hopeless. And the, two, the reasons for this is either, A, I didn't know. I think one of my biggest experiences of hope is how learning can bring you to a better hope. Learning can break false hope and false despair. There have been times where I've been really hopeless and other times I've been overly hopeful because I just didn't know because I was ignorant and so when I say hope is within our control what I partially mean by that is uh, we are in control of our own learning we can be aware that we don't know and we can be happy or excited rather than afraid that we don't know because it just might be that the more we know the more reasons or grounds we have for hope the other way that we can be agents of hope is that um, hope requires us to act. Hope drives us, calls us into the world to act on our hopes. Hope is not a passive thing where we sit back and hope for someone else to save the day. In fact, in my understanding of faith, what I believe is that God doesn't act for us necessarily, but God calls us into action and empowers us to act in the world, to make the world a more hopeful place. And so when I talk about us being agents of hope, I recognize um, this really vulnerable and beautiful position that hope in part depends on our actions, that hope in part depends on us resisting the temptations of both false hope and false despair and in patient endurance, living into true hope. So I wanna give two examples in my life. I mentioned before, and I can't go into a lot of details, but um, learning about environmental challenges, especially understanding um, just before I went to, to university, how deep our environmental challenges are um, was a, a time of deep hopelessness for me. I have been in despair, but I've also learned and have been surprised about the hope that exists that I didn't realize existed. And so I wanna give two examples of uh, hope in my life. So I wanna start by talking about war climate change, and the age of consequences. Since the late 1990s, uh, people around the world, in universities, think tanks, even government militaries, 
have recognized that climate change could put the kind of pressures on society that could erupt in violence and war. In uh, the mid-2000s, about 2004, 2005, the US military actually released a report called The Age of Consequences. And in The Age of Consequences, they basically said that climate change is real and it's gonna be a threat multiplier. Climate change inevitably will cause more violence and conflict than if there wasn't climate change. And I'm sure many of us can imagine why that is. Now, when I talk about false hope and false despair, I think false hope would say, this isn't an issue. Climate change won't cause pressure on society. Climate change won't push people to violence. And I would say that's a false hope. That's an unthoughtful false hope. But I would also say um, the age of consequences is an example of false despair. The age of consequences assumes that the possibility of violence is the inevitability of violence. A couple of years ago, I took a, a year and did some research in education projects in Kitchener Waterloo on the relationship between war and climate change, uh, conflict and the environment. And at first, in the first three or four months of my study and my education, I became deeply hopeless. But then something changed. I realized that the age of consequences is actually the age of opportunities. I looked back and I read um, uh, the political science around conflict, and I discovered some books uh, that looked at um, about 300 uh, revolutions in the 20th century. They looked at 300 revolutions against dictators, where groups try to change their society from an undemocratic one to a democratic one with social justice. And what, off, what some of these authors discovered was that in the 20th century, if you look at the violent attempts to change governments and the nonviolent attempts to change governments, nonviolent attempts actually uh, succeeded twice as much. Let me repeat that. Nonviolent revolutions at, against dictators were actually more than twice as effective as violent ones. Furthermore, over the course of the last century, in the, the 90 years before I was born, I was born in 1990, over that 100 years, nonviolence has become more and more and more effective. I have a picture here of Gandhi uh, leading the salt march in India in 1930. At that time, no one around the world really believed that nonviolence was a political strategy. The idea that you could overthrow, let's say, the empire ruling in India through nonviolence was not even thinkable. But things changed. People recognized um, over the course of the 20th century that nonviolence is an option. And interestingly enough, most people who have used nonviolence globally don't necessarily believe that it's the morally the best thing to do. They just simply believe it's the most effective thing. And so when I use this as an example for war and climate change, what I'm really talking about is there's actually hope. If there's any time in history that climate change would threaten conflict, it should be now, because there's no time in history where we as a humanity, even though we don't all necessarily recognize it, there's been never a time in history where we've had the nonviolent tools to deal with serious conflict. And that's why I think it's an age of opportunities, not just an age of consequences. Because I think the opportunity is we can take all that we've learned in the 20th century about nonviolence and apply it. So that's one example of when I talk about hope beyond false hope and false despair. There can be a lot of false hope that climate change won't cause conflict. And there can be a lot of false despair that climate change will inevitably cause violence. But with this example, what I'm saying is that there's hope beyond both the false hope and the false despair. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, climate change and environmental refugees, uh, an issue very close to my heart. If you've read anything about this, it's staggering. Um, low estimates suggest by 2050 and 2060, because of climate change, we might see about 200, to 300 more million more 
200 to 300 million more uh, environmental refugees because of climate change. Um, these numbers boggle the mind. I, I don't think any human being can actually uh, emotionally feel those numbers. We get numb by them. A false hope would suggest that there is no problem. Climate change won't cause refugees on that scale. In fact, in the past couple decades, um, actually in the last eight years, I've had a regular Google update about climate refugees. And what's really interesting is there's always like one article every month that suggests that this isn't a problem. That, oh, climate change isn't that bad. It's not going to do all these bad things. That, I would say, is false hope. On the other hand, I think sometimes people look at these numbers and say there's no way we can respond, especially um, given some of the situation now in, in Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Even if our countries are more stable, are we actually going to have the culture and the capacity to welcome this many people? And so I think there's a there's a a, a temptation to be hopeless or despairing in those situations because we can't rise to the occasion. Uh, for example, I've I've looked at uh, the shelter situation in Canada, and even at its best, even when it's fully funded. There's no way, for example, that shelters in Canada, uh, government-funded shelters um, uh, where people can stay when they first come, there's no way that they can have even the capacity to host this many people. But I want to share with you um, some work that I've been doing the last couple of years with refugee housing. Uh, this picture below here is uh, my housemates and I uh, from last April. In the, in the middle there is our friend Desale, uh, who came in, uh, what year is it? Uh, he came in September of 2018 to Canada and began living with us in October and lived with us for five months. And we as a house, uh, we were part of a, a network in town called Open Homes. Um, there was 20 families, 20 Canadian families, who would open up their home two, two or three times a year and welcome refugee families who were first arriving to the country. And it was this really, really beautiful uh, example of personal hospitality. In my notes there, I call it Christ Rooms. Um, we sometimes talk in our network, we were somewhat based in churches, about this ancient Christian practice of reserving a home, uh, research, sorry, reserving a room in your home to welcome Christ in the guise of the stranger when he came to you. And at one point I thought, wow, this is a really beautiful thing, all these people opening up their homes. What, and I, I kind of like numbers, numbers are, are interesting to me. So I sat down and crunched the numbers. I asked myself, if 10% of all regular church going people in Canada would open up their home and receive one or two refugee families a year, how many refugees could Canada welcome just based on those numbers? And so I, I did the math and I figured out that quite easily, just through that, we could welcome 2 million refugee families a year. Now, shelters would not have that capacity. I'm not saying shelters are bad. Shelters are really good and they can do things that perhaps individual families can't do. But one reality is to welcome people into your own home means that our whole country could welcome about 10 times the amounts of refugees that are currently uh, welcomed into to shelters across the country. That is a sign of hope. Now, shelters aren't the only thing that's involved in refugee resettlement. I don't want to suggest that they are. But that's a major thing, to be able to house um, uh, that many people seems miraculous to me, and it's a possibility. So both with uh, climate change and, and conflict and climate change and refugees, I have found hope and real hope, but it's hope beyond false hope and false despair. And I invite you to think about what is the hope you see beyond false hope and false despair? Both of these situations that I just shared with you, I didn't know of beforehand. When I was first learning about climate change and war or climate change and refugees, 
I didn't see these as possibilities. I didn't see these as opportunities. What I'm inviting us this morning into is a seeing with new eyes, a recognizing that when we first hear of what seems like a hopeless situation, to remember that isn't the last word, to remember that there might be more than meets the eye. For me, these two things are, are really hopeful possibilities. They're, they're signs of hope. And I wanna just offer them to you this morning as a, a, an example of finding hope beyond false hope and false despair. In the climate, ad, climate coping with climate change workshops that I've been hosting uh, in KW, I based my work somewhat on uh, the book Active Hope by Joanna Macy and Chris Johnston. Joanna Macy and Chris Johnston have done workshops all around the world, helping communities and individuals cope and adapt to our new environmental realities. And in their workshops around the world, what they've discovered is that people essentially live out of three stories. And what they meant by this is there, there were three orientations, three ways of understanding the situation that people often live out of. The first one is business as usual. The business as usual story is the story that, oh, yes, there are environmental challenges. Yes, climate change is happening, but it's really not that bad. Really, we can continue with business as usual, pretty much in perpetuity. We just need to make a few shifts on the side. Let's start recycling a little bit more and polluting a little bit less, and that's all we need to do. Climate change is a thing, but it's not that bad. So a lot of people live out of this story. The great unraveling is the second story that a lot of people live out of. This is a picture of the, the fires in Australia uh, from last summer. The great unraveling is the story that everything is unraveling. Business as usual no longer works. In fact, ecosystems and whole societies are, are collapsing. There's uh, something about this picture here that speaks to the hopelessness of the great unraveling story. The great unraveling recognizes the depth of our problem. And then from that recognition assumes that there are no solutions. Which brings us to the third story, the great turning. The great turning is a story that people live out of recognizing that the depth of the environmental challenges that we're facing require us to deeply change um, uh, a deep conversion personally in terms of our lifestyle, but a revolution in terms of how we organize ourselves economically, politically, ecologically. I really love this picture. This picture is of a acre market garden um, in Detroit. All over Detroit, urban agriculture is becoming a major thing. Uh, people are tearing up uh, empty lots and planting gardens. And in these gardens, they're providing food for themselves. What's really interesting is that I've heard people from Detroit talk about this. For a long time, Detroit hoped for a return. They hoped that the, the car manufacturers would come back. They hoped that the factories would come back and that they could live the American dream. But as years and years went by, they realized that it was the false hope. Not only in the present economic order, the factories wouldn't return, but in the long-term ecological way, it wasn't the best thing. And so communities all over Detroit, and I don't want to say everything is solved. I think there's still great movements that need to happen in that city. But all over Detroit, people are learning new ways to feed themselves, to house themselves, and to uh, take care of each other in a way that is socially just and ecologically sustainable. In order to do that, they had to live out of this great turning story to reject both false hope that things would return to normal, that they could live the American dream, but also false despair. The despair that because one hope died, there isn't other hope. 
So these are three stories that we're invited to live out of. Business as usual is the false hope story that the attachments to, to hopes or desires that aren't actually realistic. The great unraveling is the story of false despair. For myself personally, and for many of my friends, I've seen us live out of both of these stories. I know people who live out of the business as usual story. I know people who live out of the great unraveling. I myself have lived out of both. But the story that we increasingly are invited into is the story of the great turning, the story of hope beyond both false hope and false despair. This morning, I gave you a couple of examples of what hope beyond looks like. And I invite you as individuals and as a community of faith to explore what hope beyond might look like. But this is the story that we need to live out of. If we live out of both false hope and false despair, nothing good can come out of it. Imagine the best case scenario. Imagine whatever the best case scenario looks like in terms of transitioning to a sustainable society. I'm not going to fill out the details and I'm not going to paint a picture of what that best case scenario looks like. But whatever it is, whatever the best case scenario is, it will require a whole lot of us to be acting out of something other than false hope and false despair. The best case scenario won't happen unless we find that hope that's beyond false hope, that hope that's beyond false despair. I wanna reflect finally on a scripture passage which really speaks to me of the great turning. And it's from the book of Jeremiah. If you guys know the book of Jeremiah at all, you know that Jeremiah, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. Where all the other prophets at the time tell Jerusalem and tell the people that there is hope. We won't be destroyed, we can keep going. Jeremiah frequently says, give up hope. There is no hope, Jerusalem will be destroyed by Babylon. In fact, there's, there's multiple passages in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah is deeply saddened about the false prophets who say, peace, peace, where there is no peace. At one point he says, they treat the wound of my people carelessly. They're bad doctors in giving false hope, crying peace, peace, where there is no peace. I remember at, at times in the last decade of my life when I was deeply despairing, when I was deeply hopeless about climate change and our, about our environmental realities. These words would sometimes come to mind. I would hear people talk about hope and it would seem so shallow to me. And I would say these in my head, the lines would come to me, these people treat the wounds carelessly, crying sustainability, sustainability, where there is no sustainability. But what's really beautiful is this letter in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah is writing to the exiles, to the people who live in Babylon after Jerusalem is destroyed. And he writes to them, and he says this, and I'll read this passage in full. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to ba Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon 70 years are complete will I visit you and, will I, I, and I will fulfill my promise and bring you back. And this is the line that I've heard over and over again 
in uh, Christian circles and in churches. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. I know the plans I have for you, to give you a future with hope. Out of context, sometimes these words are used to prop up false hope. But I want to use these words to help us move beyond false despair. If you guys are anything like me, the realities of climate change can be crushing. Most of you probably do not live in false hope, but you might live in false despair. I can tell you as someone who believed at one point that because of climate change and environmental realities, that myself and others have no future. I can tell you as that person, there is still a future. There is still hope. It just looks different than what we've seen. And this future doesn't mean there won't be suffering. When Jerusalem was destroyed and the exiles went to Babylon, I can tell you there was suffering there. There will be loss, but beyond the loss and beyond the suffering, there is hope. A great turning is happening. I see it, I see it everywhere. And it is, the, and it, it is in this great turning and it is in this time that we can place our hope. Hope beyond both false hope and false despair. Thank you. Thank you, Isaiah, for that very inspired and uh, wise uh, presentation. Um, I am inspired to step into the momentum of the great turning rather than stand with my heels in the ground and resist in despair. So you've given us a lot to think about, and I thank you very, very much for being with us today. Thank you. Let us pray. Creative God, teach us to empathize with earth. Make our spirits sensitive to the cries of creation. Cries for justice from the land, the seas, and the skies. Creator God, Make our faith sensitive to the groans of the spirit in creation, groans of longing for new creation. Loving God, make our hearts sensitive to the songs of our kin, songs of celebration from the seas, from the forests, and from the air. Redeemer God, teach us to care. We bind ourselves unto you our loving power of god our creator the enlivening power of the spirit and steadfast faithfulness of jesus our christ we bind unto ourselves the glories of the earth this gift the power of heaven the light of sun the brightness of moon the splendor of fire the flashing of light the swiftness of wind the depth of the sea and the stability of the earth we lift up to you the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit, and to our God, our rock, a consoling force for the inconsolable at this time. For our own, we pray for the Sai family, for the Simmons Wong family, for the Little family, and to Hong Mei and her family. We lift up to you in prayer, Brian and Anne Marie Smith, Mark and Sue Habits in their time of grief. And for Nova Scotia, we hold close and summon to the side of all victims and their families, your ever everlasting presence of love now and forever. Be with them and be with us and reveal yourself to us little by little as we move more and more into the presence of your loving arms. Friends, let us take a moment to pray the silent prayers on our hearts this day.
as you are able. Join with me in reciting the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, for Jesus is to all of us like our mother and our father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I'm um, glad to invite uh, Melissa Moksoulis to sing uh, with us. She will be singing out of More Voices, uh, number 144. The song is called Like a Healing Stream. And uh, we can all sing along with Melissa in our homes and in our hearts. <clears throat> Like a healing stream in a barren desert, spirit water bringing life to the sea. God is trickling through our lives as in a dream unfolding, promising revival and rebirth. Like a healing stream. Like a gentle rain on a thirsty garden. Spirit water come to nourish tiny seeds. God is bubbling through the soil to coast a new creation. Yearning for an end to want and need. Like a gentle rain. Like a river strong with a restless current. Spirit water rushing on to distant shore. God is carving out a channel in a new direction. Calling for an end to hate and war. Like a river strong. Like a mighty sea reaching far horizons, spirit water with a love both deep and wide. God is working in our hearts to shape a new tomorrow. God will always challenge and provide, like a mighty sea. Like a river strong, like a gentle rain, like a healing stream. The great Thanksgiving. Yes, I am unmuted, right? The Great Thanksgiving. The Creator be with you and all creation. Open your hearts. Let us give thanks to our Creator, for it is right to join creation in thanking God. Your word is the impulse for all things to be, for space, stars, and stardust to appear, for earth to emerge from the deep, for life to be born of earth, and for humans to be born of earth and the spirit. Every minute of every day, God is making things new, giving and giving and giving again. And you are called, we are all called to be part of God's work of generosity as we continue to be the church in these uncertain days. You can, uh, there are still many ways in which you can provide your offerings and donations to the church. You can use your offering envelopes by placing a check in your envelope and mailing it to Emmanuel United Church, 22 Bridgeport Road West, Waterloo, Ontario, N2L, 2Y3. You can use PAR, pre-authorized remittance. To sign up or to update your PAR amount, contact Laura Mutton at the main office at 
519-886-1471. Or you can, you can go to Canada Helps um, and go to Emmanuel's website at emmanueluc.ca and click on the Canada Helps link. And finally, you can use, you can send an e-transfer to donate at emmanuelunitedchurch.ca. And your gifts to Emmanuel are important at this time to help us maintain our, um, our property and to uh, support our staff. Let us pray. For the gifts that we have received and the gifts that we will receive, we give you thanks. We know you want justice rolling down like water. Accept these gifts from our hands, which we cast upon the waters of your love, a generous, ever-flowing stream, feeding the hungry and helping those in need. Accept these gifts for the work of our church. Amen. And now, friends, uh, please join us in our closing hymn. It's a song of praise to the maker in Vo More Voices United, number 30. And Melissa will lead us again in singing this final piece. And Melissa, it looks like you are multi going to be multitasking. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a song of praise to the maker. The thrush sings high in the tree. It's a song of praise to the maker. The gray whale sings in the sea, and by the Spirit you and I can join our voice to the holy cry. And sing, sing, sing to the Maker too. It's a call of life to the giver, when waves and waterfalls roar. It's a call of life to the giver when high tide breaks on the shore. And by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry and sing, sing, sing to the Maker too. It's a hymn of love to the lover. The bumblebees hum along. It's a hymn of love to the lover. The summer breeze joins the song. And by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry. And sing, sing, sing to the Maker too. It's a chorus of all creation. It's sung by all living things. It's a chorus of all creation. A song the universe sings. And by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry and sing, sing, sing to the maker too. Wonderful, Melissa. Thank you so much for leading us in that beautiful, beautiful singing. Friends, I am reminded uh, of a quote in a world where cynicism cynicism is pervasive optimism then becomes a rebellious act let us join together and sing with the spirit of creation not with false hope not in false despair but in the pervasive optimistic hope that there is a great turning and we can be a great part of that great movement. Friends, God blesses us all. God keeps us. God's face is shining upon all of us. And it is for this reason that the peace of Christ is with us all. Amen.
Okay, Stephen, would you like to open our mics and our uh, cameras? And we will now enjoy a time of fellowship and welcoming each other in church this morning. <laughs> you can unmute everybody. your camera if you want. Sure. No, I don't want to do that. Okay. Mute it and then mute it. Bridget, turn the lights out on. What you doing with that big hand? Oh, oh, everybody looks so good. I see Rob Seamus. Oh, Sheila Burt. I see yeah. Sheila and the movie. I always feel like we're on Robber Room. I see Carolyn and I see Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. Camera. 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 But the difference, Jan, is that you actually are seeing us. She never really saw us. She never really saw us. Yeah, friend. Who's Hi, everyone. Hi, Jan. 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 Hi, Hi, no, I never saw anything. Oh, there. 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 Now, if anybody has any good news or any announcements they would like to make, so let's wave your hand. Oh, Carolyn yeah. Sullivan. Can't see uh, so today is our 46th wedding anniversary for myself and Jerry and also on Wednesday will be his 70th birthday oh so we've wow. got we've got a few COVID celebrations <laughs> wow a double hitter awesome. congratulations and happy anniversary online for um, Disney like Walt Disney I guess at their park and they they asked Jerry the too. cookie fry and so okay. the same idea where I don't know. Maybe that's as many as you put on a oh, oh, I see. Okay, I see a hand. Gordon, Vanessa, you have something to say? Yeah, um, it's hard to follow, but uh, we celebrated our 11th anniversary. Oh. We can't see the hand. I don't think anyone could hear me. Uh, Gordon and I celebrated our 11th anniversary yesterday. Oh, happy anniversary. That's incredible. Yeah, that's great. Happy anniversary. Okay. Melissa Muxulis. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to say welcome to my mom and dad, Murray and Wanda Keith, are watching from Godridge to join in the service. So, Erica's grandma and grandpa. See grandma? Oh, she's not. Hi, really. Murray and Wanda. And I think for a moment my sister Sharon had joined in from Northern British Columbia. So uh, oh. we had sent out a message that I'd be singing this morning so entice them to join the service. So uh, nice to have family, even though they're far away and, and we're missing hugs, but good to see everyone. So. That is so great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And welcome, welcome, Murray and Wanda and, and everyone who's joining us um, from outside the community. We love that you're here. Any, anyone else? Do I see any other raised hands? I see Delaney. Delaney, do you have a raised hand? Yeah, Delaney. Yes, um, good um, today, um, so it, it's really, um, I, I don't know. I'm really excited. Um, at um one o'clock today, um, my dad is going to meet um, um, uh, like this little one-year-old cat, and if it's a good match, then she can come home with us. 
Oh. Oh, so excited. I love cats. Oh, I'm so <laughs> hoping that it's a good match. I'll be praying for that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go get our boots. Okay. Hi, Ian and Priscilla. We miss you. Anybody else have something to say? Do I see any other hands? Oh, let me check my other screen. Yeah, we've got uh, Graham Brendan. and Gra Brendan. So I got new toys. <laughs> Guess who? Oh, what is it? Guess who? Yeah. I love that game. This is my. Oh, now I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it in the video. I love I it. Know, I am a no win. So I you have a winning score too if you see Bale's clothes. I love <laughs> it. Brendan, are you excited to have a little brother or a little sister to play with? Excited to be a big brother. It is more excited about guess who right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you asked him another time, he'd say yes. But Absolutely. yes, right now, guess who is winning? Thanks for sharing. up to five. only page. Yeah. Oh, and Claire, I want. I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to offer my most heartfelt apologies. I think that uh, we missed our first board game, our virtual board game that Clara uh, Leslie had set up. And um, did anybody make that, Clara? Um, no, it was just oh, in the dear. server waiting for people to join up. Oh my goodness. So I'm so, I, uh, I think we forgot about that. So we're gonna have to um, figure out a better way to get us uh, all together. Maybe uh, we could set up a meeting here on like the day of and yeah. then Yeah, let's figure out how to maybe who are the people who would be interested in playing a virtual board game? And then maybe we could get that group into um Why don't you post the link for the group for the Emmanuel board game night? Yeah. And then uh who sets up these meetings? It's Stephen, right? Stephen, yeah. So, what if, yeah. what if I, what if we um, announce it? So we've announced it here. What if we announce it in a manual weekly? Yeah. On Friday, and then uh, we'll actually um, hold it on a day. So, um, well, we we'll have to figure out what kind of day. We should get the people who are actually interested together, so that those people can then pick a day. Uh, so yeah. let oh, let's let's get a week or so to get some feedback about the people who are interested. Let's send an email to me or to Clara, and then once we have a group of people, we'll go from there. We uh, and uh, I'm more than happy. Like I think we should set up something like this so that we can help anyone out who's having problems joining the group. Absolutely, absolutely, because I'm sure to be one of them. I can do that, Clara. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much, Stephen. We can so kind of like have the help room on one side, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we We're... can still talk to each other while we play the game. So yeah. we can have the, the voice open at the same time. Actually, the server comes with a thing where you can talk. <laughs> But I'll show people how to turn that off so we can use the go to meeting. Yes. Um, I on your Facebook, Stephen. I'm not sure. I'll send you. Uh, you can find me through Karen, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then I'll get you to. Can I get you to join the group, and then you can. Uh... Yeah. Just send me the instructions. Okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. If there's no other good news or announce, oh yeah, Linda Oliver. Oh no, okay. 
If there's no other announcements or good news, let me just say thank you so much again to Isaiah for um, his sharing your incredible uh, gift, uh, education, knowledge, and wisdom with us. And um, this has been recorded, so it will come out on our Facebook page, and you'll also get a link to it in our Emanuel Weekly next week. And thank you for logging in. Thank you for being the amazing church that you continue to be, and we will see you all again next week. Go in peace. Bye, everybody. Peace be with Bye, you. Bye bye now. Bye, Ken. Bye, Rachel. Bye, Mommy. Bye. Blessings Bye. to everyone. Yeah. Peace be with you. you too. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye, Jennifer. Bye, Jennifer. Bye. Singing. Hi, Melissa. Bye. Thanks for singing, Melissa. You did a beautiful job. Amazing job. Erica was saying goodbye, Delaney. Bye. Bye, Delaney. Bye. 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 Good luck with the kitty. Thank you, Murray. It's wonderful yes. being with us. It's our, it's our pleasure, pleasure to be here. Bye. Bye. I see you. Okay. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Erica. <laughs>